from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. The eclipse brings hope. It's definitely, yeah, it's an opportunity to grow. You know, it's an opportunity to uh, expose, you know, the core of what Carroll is. As rural towns hope for revitalization. Plus, dairy exports are pumping out good news for the industry. As bovine practitioners say, it's time to call avian influenza and dairy cattle by another name. Details ahead. Plus, it's planting time as experts urge farmers to double check everything. So, you know, growers got to stop, check things out, but they got to start and knowing that it's set. The latest on crop progress and conditions right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when blood, sweat, and tears meet rain, wind, and sun. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Clint Griffiths. The return of warmer and drier weather has field work ramping up across the Midwest. On Monday, USDA released its latest crop progress report as those planters roll. After a hit or miss week, weather-wise, USDA says 3% of the nation's corn crop is now planted. That's one point ahead of the five-year average. Texas leads the way. It's now 59% planted, while in the I states, Illinois is 2%. Iowa and Indiana are yet to start. Winter wheat is maturing ahead of average. 6% is now headed. Condition-wise, 56% of that crop is rated good to excellent. A year ago, it was just 27% of the crop rated that high. And looking south, 5% of the nation's cotton crop is now in the ground, one point behind the five-year average. Planters are just starting to roll, but based on the forecast, it could be a big week for planting progress in some states. So what's the key to growing those big yields? Well, according to the reigning National Corn Yield Contest champion, David Hula, you can't have 300 bushel per acre yields if you don't start with 300 bushel per acre stands. Now, Hula is known for his big yields. His winning national corn yield average was a whopping 623.8 bushels per acre. Now, we asked him, what's the secret to those big yields? And he says, there's no magic bullet, but based on one of his trials last year, it can be something as simple as making sure your planter is set perfectly. That includes the closing wheel system being centered. One row tie actually was as low as 198 bushels. That's not bad, but on a 24 row planter, one row was 302. So we had a 104 bushel difference between that. And you know, did one row get better weather? Absolutely not. The planter was not performing like it should. I was with Randy Dowdy and as fast as he could walk from one row to the next, he figured out the problem. It was a closing wheel system, wasn't centered. So growers got to stop, check things out, but they got to start and knowing that it's set. Hula says many times farmers want to blame the weather. However, he's found sometimes it just falls back to small mistakes that can cause big losses in yield. Despite some scattered rain and snow showers, milder weather is expected across big portions of the country. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht has the very latest. Yeah, we look off uh, into our Tuesday and Wednesday. And what you'll see is, uh, yeah, pretty quiet weather, but there is going to be a low pressure system. It's not as strong as the one last week. Remember, we we're talking severe weather last Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, but this is going to produce some thunderstorms, possibly some strong thunderstorms uh, Tuesday and into Wednesday as this works up to the north and to the northeast. Severe weather threat back into the Midwest and the northeast remains pretty low, but a soaking uh, type of rainfall in the forecast into Friday and then starting to clear out Saturday and Sunday, both Friday afternoon, Saturday and Sunday with possibility maybe some snow back up into New York State and into Canada. Otherwise, you got more zonal patterns setting up. We'll, of course, take a look at this regarding the jet stream coming up in just a little bit. A pretty quiet across the United States going into the weekend. Speaking of quiet going into the weekend, consistency can be hard to come by this time of year. Take a look at this picture. This is out of Oregon. I posted it to Twitter late last week. He says it's a typical spring day in central Oregon. Two days before it was 80 degrees, then covered in snow. This week, temperatures are expected to rebound back into the 60s. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. An update on the situation near the port of Baltimore. Crews have started removing shipping containers 
from the Dolly almost two weeks after it slammed into the Francis Scott Key Bridge, causing that bridge to collapse. Now, the U.S. Coast Guard says it is working to take enough weight off the ship so it can eventually be moved. Once enough debris is removed, they can also reopen the channel to larger commercial ships, which they hope to do by the end of May. Now, the port traditionally has been a significant handler of construction and agricultural equipment. An update on the outbreak of avian influenza and dairy cattle now stretching into six states. The American Association of Bovine Practitioners says it's renaming the virus to Bovine Influenza A virus, or BIAV. The International Veterinary Group says while the virus is the same, type A, H5N1 as avian influenza, the impact of that virus on cattle is different. It doesn't cause the same high morbidity and mortality that it does in birds. So it's changing how it's referenced, saying bovine influenza A more accurately depicts the virus in cattle. Now part of the reason for the change is for the public, so it can distinguish the difference between the impact to different animal species. And health and industry experts continue to stress increased biosecurity measures for dairy producers. Now it's recommending a focus on minimizing access of wild birds to cattle and their environment. Be mindful of cattle movement and transport. Don't feed raw or unpasteurized colostrum or milk to cattle, calves, or other mammals. Make sure caretakers are cautious when working with sick cows, unpasteurized milk, when handling sick or dead birds, and or small mammals. And it's important to sanitize milking equipment, especially after milking sick cows. You can read more by using your smartphone and scanning the QR code on your screen. The Environmental Protection Agency has committed to fully implementing the Endangered Species Act, and that requires all federal agencies ensure their actions don't harm nearly 1,700 endangered or threatened species. Ag Day's Michelle Rook joins us. And Michelle, what does it mean and how costly could this be for farmers? But in a study commissioned in key states by the American Soybean Association shows that the Endangered Species Act is fully implemented. Its provisions will affect the crop protection products used by farmers on nearly every acre in the U.S. And that will result in a huge economic burden for farmers. Under the act, EPA can't register pesticides under the Federal Insecticide, Fungicide, and Rodenticide Act, or FIFRA, unless applicants can show that properly using crop protection products won't cause unreasonable adverse effects on the environment. So ASA's Steve Sensky says some farmers could lose the use of certain herbicides. Most producers today would not be able, would not be in compliance with the EPA's draft herbicide strategy as they've reduced it, as they've released it. Um, and that in order to comply, it would be very costly for them to implement these activities. He says they understand EPA is being mandated by the courts after years of failed litigation. However, for many farmers, the cost to protect listed species so they can use certain pesticides is so high it could put them out of business. In many cases, they would have to do multiple, take multiple steps to even to try to comply and earn the number of points that to be eligible to be able to use those herbicides. They would have to implement, you know, not only cover crops, but uh, buffer strips. They might have to, uh, you know, reduce their rates of herbicide application uh, by half or more. Um, and it would just be all very expensive, very costly, and uh, really not practical at all. Mary Kay Thatcher with Syngenta says they agree with the ASA's cost analysis and the call for EPA to provide better maps identifying where endangered species are located. And she says they must also counter maps released by groups like the Center for Biological Diversity. They want to say not just, oh, this fish is uh, an endangered species, let's cover this creek, but let's cover this whole area where that fish might go sometime in the future. So uh, that's going to mean we're also going to have to step our side of the game up to come up with maps that are probably more reasonable. However, ASA also says maps should account for the impact current conservation practices are having on preserving species and the actual usage data. Sensky says EPA is assuming maximum label rates times the maximum number of applications so they aren't using sound science. I'm Michelle Rook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. Now grains lean higher as we start the week as that planting starts to pick up steam. We'll talk markets coming up next. And later, thousands of rural towns became gathering points for the total solar eclipse. 
we'll stop by one Southern Illinois community, hoping it's not the end, but the beginning of a new chapter. Ag Day is brought to you by Germinator Closing Wheels. Germinator Steel Closing Wheels provides a 13 bushel advantage per acre in no-till and a 7 bushel advantage per acre in conventional. Do you have enough room in your bin to switch to the Germinator? So where are commodity markets headed? Michelle Rook is back with a closer look in Markets Now. Grain and livestock futures both mixed on Monday. Brian Grady with Pro Farmer is back with us. And Brian, grain's pretty quiet on Monday, but if you look at most of the grains, we're pretty range bound and sideways, aren't we? Absolutely. You know, news is relatively light at the moment. Uh, the price action is pretty directionless, like you mentioned, just kind of back and forth trade here. Uh, we have USDA supply and demand report coming up on Thursday. That'll be the next set of, of potentially market moving mo news that uh, the, the market will get. And whether or not that actually has any impact or much of an impact, it will be seen. But uh, uh, at least that's the next potential batch that, that could really move the markets. Right. We can't seem to take out these key moving averages. So what do you think we would have to have in the report to be able to break through or above those levels? Well, the expectation is that corn ending stocks will decline, but still remain uh, comfortably above 2 billion bushels. And, and so uh, I think that we'd not only need to see ending stocks decline, but probably decline a little bit more than the 70 million bushels that uh, the average trade estimate is going into the reports. Not a whole lot of movement expected on soybeans and wheat ending stocks, just a little bit higher on both of those. And, and so uh, if there's going to be a bullish catalyst, it probably would have to come from the corn side of things. March 1 stocks told us that uh, they were tighter than what the market was anticipating. So we could see increases in exports for corn, uh, corn for ethanol use and feed use. And so uh, I think that uh, we need a, a bullish set of data for corn on Thursday. Yeah. So left kettle futures ending higher on Monday. But Brian, is that market getting close to a bottom, do you think? Well, uh, I think for the, the market to bottom, we need to see the cash bottom. Uh, it declined 250 last week. Uh, we need to see wholesale beef prices uh, put in a bottom. They posted strong gains on Monday morning. And, and so there's some signs there of uh, potential bottoming in wholesale prices. Uh, the futures still have a long ways to go and the cash market needs to put in a bottom. Yeah, but you got to get the funds to quit selling too, right? Absolutely. And, and they've been just more fear trade than anything. Liquidation uh, caused by the, the influenza A in the, in the bovine, the, the dairy herd. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, Brian. Brian Brady with Pro Farmer. We'll have more Ag Day coming up. I wanted to go ahead and uh, take another look at that drought monitor. Now, we are going to get some help with rainfall, but notice where we've had problems regarding the drought, uh, I'd say the last couple of months. Remember, going into winter and then coming out of it, it was very dry back into Houston, Texas, Louisiana, back down here to the south and to the southeast. We've eliminated the drought through a good portion of those areas, still into Iowa, uh, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, where we still have uh, some rain needed, much needed rain needed in those areas. We'll try to get it, but I think that next system that comes through is going to cut more to the east rather than to the north. It does not mean that we won't get any rain out of it, but it looks like it's going to be expanding more to the east and the northeast with this next system. What next system? Glad you asked. A precipitation forecast for this week, mostly rain. You see most of the heaviest rain situated right near the, uh, the Mississippi. Uh, that's uh, obviously going to be flowing from north to the south. But right along that is where we'll start to see some thunderstorms, perhaps even some severe weather. Now, this week, we're looking at more rainfall back to the east and to the northeast. And as I mentioned, where that drought is located, the system is going to be cutting more to the north and to the northeast rather than coming to the north, uh, helping parts of Minnesota, Iowa. But we will get some rainfall into Wisconsin, uh, possibly another half an inch uh, up to about two inches of rainfall, not out of the question. That's over the course of the week, not just 
obviously one day. So we'll get a couple of shots at some rain boom through the Midwest. On the other side of the coin, uh, talking about the snowfall potential. This is Wednesday at 9 a.m. Uh, we're still kind of in that season, as we saw in that picture, where we can get enough cold air and moisture to produce some snow. This map looks a lot different this week than what it did last week. Last week it was a combination of not only a strong low pressure system, but that cold air driving from the north to the south. And while we do expect a storm system uh, to uh, to move across the United States, it's not going to be as strong as the one from last week. There's the jet stream coming into Thursday with that next storm system and then a ridge of high pressure building in. Start off in Virginia, higher on 76 degrees, mostly cloudy, high, uh, low of 59 degrees. Again, that's uh, in Virginia. Wyoming, partly cloudy, high of 58, low of 33. And Oklahoma, got some showers, high of 66. For the first time ever, U.S. dairy exports in February topped 500 million pounds for the month. That's as 18% of the U.S. milk supply is now exported as dairy products overseas. According to the latest data from USDA, dairy exports hit 501 million pounds in February, a 5.5% increase year over year. Cheese exports shot up 27% compared to the same time last year, with Mexico purchasing a record amount. A growing appetite from Mexico played a crucial role in boosting those exports, as did lower prices, which helped make products like cheese more competitive. Dairy producers are holding on to fewer replacement heifers, and that's causing the milking herd numbers to fall to the lowest in more than four years. Lucas Fees is the senior dairy analyst for Rabo Research. He says even with improving milk prices, dairy producers aren't growing. And if you look back at history, as profits go up, so do cow numbers and milk production. As a result, Fees thinks a bullish situation could be brewing for milk prices. Another reason heifer numbers could stay tight is strong beef prices incentivize beef on dairy. Currently, a beef cross calf is selling for $700 to $800, but a Holstein bull calf is only bringing $300. Well, the eclipse is now in the history books, and some rural towns are hoping the notoriety and crowds can help them write a new chapter. That story next. Totality for Monday's eclipse was only about 115 miles wide, but in that space there are hundreds of small towns. One of them in Illinois hopes four minutes of darkness will help return the prosperity that was lost decades ago. Gary Tuckman is there ahead of the rush. What is it like to be the manager of the only hotel in a city that is about to experience solar eclipse totality, the city of Cairo, Illinois? Well, it's pretty darn good. Today, I think the rate is, what, $80 a night? Yep, it'll be $80 plus tax. $80 plus tax. The night before the eclipse, how much is it? It's around $500. $500? Yep. $500. And it's sold out? Yeah. Cairo, named after the capital of Egypt, but pronounced differently, has had a pronounced economic decline over generations. The once prosperous southern Illinois city sits adjacent to where the Mississippi and Ohio rivers meet. Cairo has lost almost 90% of its population from a century ago. This is a look at downtown Cairo in the 1950s. Now the same exact downtown street is almost abandoned. Rubble from some bulldozed buildings hasn't been touched in years. Many businesses, including hotels, restaurants, stores, and a hospital, have been shut down. There are still some elegant homes and museums of former homes. People we talk to who remain are very loyal. I love it here. Gabriel Harris owns GNL Clothing with his wife Lawanda. Like the hotel manager, they're excited about the tourists coming to see the eclipse and what it could mean for Cairo. Do you feel that this could be this could perhaps make things better for your business in the weeks and months? Oh, most to come? definitely, yeah. It's an opportunity to grow. You know, you, it's an opportunity to uh, expose you know the core of what Cairo is. Shemwell's Barbecue is one of only two sit-down restaurants that remain in Cairo. Brittany Harrell is a proud employee. We've been here for a hundred years, so I guess we do something right. And the best thing that you could tell everyone about Cairo right now is what? That we have good barbecue and we have friendly people. And Brittany also tells us she has a wish. A wish that the solar eclipse could be a turning point. I hope that one day we could be that thriving city that we once were. 
The glory days of Cairo, Illinois have been gone for a long time. But for a few minutes on Monday, in a very different sense, it will be most glorious to be here in Cairo. So you need five. Five, okay. yeah. One, two, three. Businesses are passing out Eclipse glasses. Chairs will be set up in the business district for Eclipse viewers who want a comfortable seat. Cairo, Illinois, the city of solar eclipse totality, is getting ready for its stay in the sun. Maybe the next time you come this way, you'll see a, a, a totally different change. All right, thanks, Gary. Gary Tuckman reporting. And that's all the time we have this morning. We're sure glad you tuned in. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Clinton Have a great day.